Okay, let's start. Yeah. All right, warm welcome everyone to the Collegium Talks on Global Governance, Legitimacy and Democracy. And uh, warm thanks to the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies for organizing the event. Um, having just experienced a pandemic and being still in the middle of yet another economic crisis, we all witness daily how um, experts make decisions affecting um, our lives. Uh, and since technocratic experts often do not work in positions where they are democratically elected or, or directly democratically accountable, this of course poses questions from the perspective of legitimacy. And, and this is the theme that we'll be talking about today. We'll have three talks addressing this um, topic from different angles. We'll have Nicole Hassoun, who will provide some ideas on how to ensure legitimacy of technocratic decision making. We have Jan Klabbers, who will discuss uh, the tensions between expert governance and democratic legitimacy uh, through the case of global health and um, current negotiations on a possible um, pandemic treaty. And then uh, finally, we have David Slosberg, who will call for a global agreement on the non-use of so solar geoengineering. And also, he will analyze the problems that uh, this solar geoengineering uh, poses regarding justice and, and governance. And each of the speakers will speak about 10 minutes. Um, then we'll have a, I'll give each of them an possibility to address each other's topics, and then we will have a, have a um, discussion. Um, my name is Ukri Soirla, and yeah, I'll be moderating uh, today's discussion. So our first speaker is Nicole Hassoun, who is a core fellow at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, and also a professor at Binghamton University, as well as the executive director of the Global Health Impact organization, and she has published widely in uh, philosophy, economics, and public health, including the books Global Health Impact, published by Oxford University Press, and Globalization and Global Justice by Cambridge University Press. So. Thank you. Okay. And I'd just like to thank the um, Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies for organizing the events and uh, bringing us together for this conversation. I'm going to talk about the legitimacy of technocracy. I'm a philosopher, so it will be pretty theoretical. But I think we'll have some applied case studies um, <laughs> next about global health and uh, geoengineering. I became interested, though, in the question of when is it OK for experts to make decisions with significant consequences for people's lives when I was um, giving a talk at the Global Fund. Now, the Global Fund is an organization that helps distribute uh, malaria, TB, and HIV medications around the world. And they were considering using a metric I'd created of, of the lives saved and disability alleviated with interventions for these diseases in their aid allocation formula. And I was sitting around this table with a bunch of other people who work in this space, um, people who are mostly white middle-aged guys from the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene um, and related institutions. And I thought, wow, if with one swipe of his pen, the technocrat who's in charge of this aid allocation formula, if they change that formula, millions of people are going to live who would otherwise maybe have died. And other people will die who might have, who might have lived. And so, what makes us <laughs> the right people to ask about how we should allocate this aid, right? Um, who, who should have a say here? And that's the question of legitimacy that I'm interested in. And I'm going to argue very briefly that those who are affected by these decisions should really be at that table. And normally, they should have a say in the process by which such significant decisions are made so that uh, the allocation is better um, or more appropriately responsive to their interests. So it protects their basic interests in living well enough. OK. But to explain what I'm going to talk about, I, I need to step back and talk a little bit about what do I mean by legitimacy, technocracy, and, um, and what kind of decisions are we interested in. So first, um, uh, I'm going to use legitimacy as kind of a moral notion. So you might think that a decision is a good one or an acceptable one for people to make. Maybe people in general think that about their government. But that's uh, my question is about whether people think it's OK for people <coughs> to make these decisions. I'm interested in whether it's really OK. 
So I'm, I'm interested in legitimacy as kind of a normative idea. Um, and if it's okay, then you might have to go along with a rule that somebody makes. But then again, maybe it's okay for you to protest against it. So I'm not going to assume anything about what people have to do. Um, I'm just interested in when is it okay for experts, um, technocrats, to make decisions that affect people's lives. And a technocrat is someone, I will suppose, who has real genuine expertise. That is, they have knowledge or skills that can be useful for making some decisions. So maybe they're a geological engineer and they can tell us when an earthquake's likely to happen, or maybe they're a climate scientist and they can tell us where the flooding's gonna happen, or maybe they're a, you know, a computer engineer or a lawyer or an economist, but they have some useful information for us. Okay? And these guys are not elected people and they're not even appointed by elected people. So we're thinking about those in the bureaucracy of states, those in international institutions. And then finally, um, what kinds of decisions are at stake? I, wa I want to focus on decisions that affect people's basic life prospects. So their ability to live what I'll call a minimally good life. And I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Um, and so the question again is, you know, when is it okay for people to make uh, decisions that affect people's lives uh, so significantly? And there's lots of reasons to worry about whether technocrats are the right people to do this, um, whether technocracy is compatible with democratic values, public participation, representative governance, flexibility in the face of crises, and responsiveness to people's values. Um, and so I'm going to suggest that um, what, we, what we should do to make sure that it's responsive to people's values and to make sure that it's compatible with democratic um, considerations uh, is to give people who are deeply affected by the decisions these experts are making a say in the process by which they're made. And so this could be done in a lot of different ways, and we'll talk about some of these concrete examples in a minute. But why give people a say? Well, it's precisely because they are so deeply affected by these decisions, and they need some control over their basic life prospects. Um, moreover, I think when we give people who are on the ground a say in decisions, we get information that's really important and can help improve those decisions so they better protect people's interests. Those who are deeply affected also have a stake in those decisions. And so, if we look to the philosophical literature about what makes uh, decisions legitimate, what makes governments legitimate or international institutions, most of them require more than just that people have some kind of say. They might have to say, they might say that you know, these institutions have to be fully democratic or they have to make the right decisions. And so I think this basic principle, this minimal principle, might get an overlapping consensus amongst people with very different views. But we need to say what interests are affected and how people should have a say. And so the interests I'm in, um, I want to protect um, include being able to live what I call a minimally good life. And I've just finished a book on that topic. If you're interested, you can come to the book launch in June. But basically, the idea is you, you put yourself in other people's shoes. You think, there but for the grace of God go I. What would I need to live well enough as that person? And if, you're, if there's any serious reason to doubt that someone's life can be well lived, then I think you have reason to worry about whether this decision is affecting their life in an acceptable way. And therefore, they should have a right to kind of say, put, have a say in the process. So that's the, the way I understand the decisions, that's, uh, the interests at stake in the decision and what we should ultimately protect for people. And you might also have to protect human rights. You might also have to give people a say for other reasons. But at least when their ability to live minimally well is at stake, I want to say people need to have a say in decisions that affect those fundamental interests. Now, you might disagree with this. You might think, well, is it really necessary for people to have a say? Or maybe it could be counterproductive, for instance. If you give people a say over some decisions, maybe they'll come to deeply regret them. And I think that's true, right? So we want to give people a say in cases where it makes a difference, in cases where it helps to protect those basic interests. So if people lack the information necessary to make a decision, if experts really have all the information they need to make a, an adequate decision, and um, there's just no way that you can get people's feedback um, without making things worse, then you shouldn't ask them. But in many cases, I think we can develop deliberative polls, democratic procedures, and ways of getting feedback from people that can actually improve processes and help us um, get to better decisions. Um, a different worry, though, is, well, maybe technocracy is fundamentally illegitimate, right? Maybe it's just not democratic enough. So some have argued that at least since, like, the 1980s, technocrats working for international institutions have spread neoliberal values 
which many people um, reject. So the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, for instance, have spread this kind of free market ideology requiring countries to liberalize and, and privatize markets to gain access to aid and to engage in international trade, largely to the benefit of rich countries. So they've, they've created rules under the guise of expertise without regard for the distributive effects of their policies. And often the policies have actually further impoverished poor people. So they've had to privatize land and even essential services like education and healthcare. And international corporations that invest in these countries at concessionary rates often get great gains, but they don't necessarily provide uh, sufficient benefits to local populations. So critics might claim that technocracy is illegitimate in part because it fails to uh, secure people's endorsement. And I think there's actually a great deal of truth to that kind of objection. But the problem could be at least partly remedied by the kind of public participation that I defend. Um, and so economists can tell us what well, will increase growth on average. If they're properly employed, they could look at the distributive effects of various policies. But those affected could have a say in the decisions with significant consequences that exceed their expertise, which is, and I think, often the case, often essential for advancing uh, their interests or protecting them. Uh, my view is really radical. Um, I think that an implication of it is that it doesn't matter where people are affected, but they should have a say in the decisions. So it's not okay for people in the global north to make decisions that significantly affect people's lives in the global south without giving them a say. Um, and one way of ensuring that everyone's so deeply affected might be through more representative governance of states or international institutions and non-governmental organizations' decision-making processes. So we can think about diversifying decision-making throughout those institutions, as well as including feedback mechanisms within them. But obviously, in 10 minutes, there's lots of questions I can't answer. Um, I'd love to uh, talk with you guys all about some of those. So I'm just going to put this out there and then say, hopefully, um, we'll get to discuss uh, in a few more minutes. And I'll hand it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Or, you know, <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Nicole, for this wonderful talk. So next, we have Jan Klappers, who is a professor of international law at the University of Helsinki here. And he's published very widely on international law, including international organizations law. And he's also the uh, leader of the project uh, Intergovernmental Organizations Between Mission and Market, or Privico, uh, which also I work on currently, <laughs> and, and Rita in the audience. So. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you. I never thought I would ask this in a room like this, but can you guys hear me properly? The, I thought the mic was a bit uh, disturbing, but there we go. About a century ago, John Maynard Keynes, you may have heard of him, finished his book on the economic consequences of the Versailles Peace with an appeal to um, the hearts and minds of people. As he put it, I'm not writing this to influence the statesmen of today, I'm writing this in order to influence the hidden currents, as he put it. He wrote the same, pretty much, in his General, Theori uh, General Theory in 1936. Again, the last page is dedicated to outlining what it is he was trying to achieve. And at least one of his biographers, there are many, one of his biographers has noted that he would have been very pleased with expert governance in the United Kingdom in his day. Just a couple of old Etonians with the right attitude, the right mindset, the right education. That would do the trick. So not surprisingly, <laughs> he is sometimes considered as a forerunner of expert governance, the right experts, of course. So, whether he was a forerunner is debatable, though already in the mid-19th century, several international organizations were established with the idea of ju doing just that. Think of the International Telegraph Union, whose aim was to regulate telegraphic movements with the help of engineers who could control cables and submarine cables and figure out which telegraph language would be optimal, that sort of thing. Think of the Universal Postal Union, a, a, again, an expert-based international organization. And if you go back to studies of the late 19th, early 20th, mid-20th, even late 20th century, 
on international organizations, you'll typically see this distinction being made between technical organizations and political organizations. The political organizations then are the League of Nations and the UN, not much more really. The rest is considered technical. And an even more obvious example from the 19th century are the various regional sanitary bureaus that were established in places like Tangier, Tehran, Alexandria, Constantinople, creating a nice cordon sanitaire around Europe. And as soon as the US became a superpower, a Pan-American health organization was established protecting the US from contagious diseases coming from elsewhere. So obviously, this whole spiel about pure technocracy never really worked. And I could give you an example of the Universal Postal Union going back five years, but I won't in the interest of time. Expert authority always mingles with politics, sometimes in a very obvious way. No one really believes that there's only one proper version of economics, right? Please tell me no one really <laughs> believes that anymore. <laughs> it's, uh, think of 50 years of austerity on the command of economists and still nothing happening. No one, by the same token, believes that there would be only one way of ordering regularly migration or population control. Like, there is a UN agency for this. It is filled with people who know about population control, and yet family planning and birth control are pretty political, right? Uh, e even something as mundane as the World Heritage Site nominations at UNESCO. You cannot take the politics out of that politics. But in some other domains, the politics is a bit less obvious. We tend to trust our engineers. If they say this is the way to build a bridge, I'm not going to argue with them, right? If our doctors tell me smoking is bad for us, again, I'm not going to argue with them. Yet, talking about the doctors, here too politics creeps in, if only, but importantly, in the forms of, que of questions about distribution. This takes place on the level of the actual policies that the organizations, that an organization such as the World Health Organization might wish to sponsor. It has been known for quite some time that smoking is bad for us, but it took the World Health Organization until 2003 to come up with a rather watered down convention on smoking against smoking, a convention actually on tobacco control, which is not even against smoking, strictly speaking. Um, and that would not have happened without the drive of the director general at the time, Gro Harlem Brundtland. Second, these political questions come up in further legal choices to be made. And if I put it like that, it sounds a bit cryptic. But what I mean is questions such as, should the pandemic treaty that is being negotiated right now, should it actually be a treaty? Or should it be another type of instrument? Could it be an international health regulation, which is something the World Health Organization has the power to adopt by majority, super majority, but still, to become binding on all member states of the World Health Organization, uh, unless they technically opt out, and very few would do that. Should it be a health regulation or maybe a recommendation? This happened, for the historically inclined among you, with the attempts in the World Health Organization to regulate the use of breast milk substitutes in the 1980s. The plan was to have a convention. Didn't work, because Nestle was against. Okay, let's have a health regulation. Didn't work, because Nestle was against. So it ended up being a recommendation by the World Health Organization. Further questions, should there be a framework convention with further possible adjustments, which can then be done by the te technical experts, as often happens in the environmental field? Or should it be a more regular convention with hard and fast obligations spelled out? And finally, not exhaustively perhaps, is the instrument that we are about to negotiate, is that coming with a monitoring body? Should there be a monitoring body? What kind of monitoring body? Should it be the same as 
the monitoring bodies in the human rights field or in the environmental field or different. Those are all questions that look like technical legal questions but have clear political dimensions. I mentioned Nestle, not a coincidence. Some states in the World Health Organization currently negotiating the pandemic treaty are very keen on insisting that it will actually be a treaty which has to be approved then in accordance with domestic requirements, meaning that they cannot be bound against their will. If it would be a health regulation, they could hypothetically be bound against their will because it's so awkward to opt out. You look really like a loser when you're the only one in the room saying, we're not going to do this. Whereas if you're not going to ratify it, no one hardly notices. Um, on the third level, the politics creeps in in questions such as what kind of rules should we have? Should there be equal access for everyone? Should there be equity in, in vaccines when it comes to the pandemic? Uh, who shall bear the costs? Should there be technology transfers? Should there be obligatory, uh, what is it, transmission of pathogens? That sort of thing. And then finally, there are always procedural questions, which to the lawyer is where the politics really comes in very nicely. Should negotiations have a deadline? You think, what, what on earth does that matter? Well, it matters because negotiating teams have different sizes, different people in the teams. The negotiator for Zimbabwe has a lot less uh, manpower, if you will, a lot less resources than negotiators for the US or France, etc., etc. Should there be rules on who can take part in the negotiations? Should there be rules on speaking time? Very mundane, and yet that is where the politics often already creeps in. And what you see in the negotiations on the pandemic treaty slash regulation, because that's still unclear, I understand, is best summed up in a nice quote that I yesterday picked up from the internet, coming from the Heritage Foundation, a very conservative think tank in the United States, which made the point a week ago that the latest iteration of the World Health Organization's proposed pandemic agreement retains many provisions that are harmful to US national interests. There you go, so much for a pandemic treaty and global solidarity, right? And it continued, the Heritage Foundation in its infinite wisdom, it continued by suggesting that the latest draft really just rewarded China. Overtones of a certain person sitting in the White House a few years ago, and maybe soon again. In such a climate, with the big powers fighting it out, it is tempting to fall back on expert governance, obviously. But the experts are equally obviously not equipped to make political decisions. If you're a doctor, you're a doctor. You might know everything about you know, the pandemic that is going on, about the viruses, about cancer, whatever. But you're not in a position to make political decisions. That would then put the ball back in the court of our democratically elected politicians. But they too are not very well equipped. And I say that with a lot of doesn't sound like it, but I say that with a lot of respect and affect, uh, what is it, affect, effectiveness, that's not the word, affection, that's the word. Um, because they usually have to be generalists, they usually are not trained international lawyers who can actually cut through the nonsense of arguments about whether it should be legally binding or not legally binding, or whether it should be monitoring body or not monitoring body. So what they do is they pander to the media and they tow the party line. Again, one example, very random, I yesterday picked up from the internet, is a member of parliament for the Tories in Britain, the Honorable Bob Seeley, who basically just relied on promises made by his government. I quote, when he was asked about uh, whether or not the pandemic treaty would do something against British interest, he, he said, and I quote, the health secretary has personally assured that the government will not support any treaty which compromises the UK's sovereignty. So that's great then. Parliamentary control, we just take the government's word for it and we go on as if nothing happens. So on this kind of note, 
democracy hardly comes in and hardly can come in. But many of those choices that I mentioned, uh, treaty or regulation, etc., etc., they are even there to prevent democracy from creeping in. Democracy is trying, is, is getting circumvented as well as the role, a possible role for the courts. Typically, that is why states opt for non-binding instruments so that they don't have to submit it to parliament because after all, they're not committing their country in any legally relevant sense. And thus, courts cannot identify any rights that you and I might get under such a non-legal agreement because it's non-legal. Parliament can be circumvented, the Politburo possibly can be circumvented, although that's less likely. Uh, courts can be circumvented, and the experts and governments are given free hand. But of course you cannot expect members of Parliament to even have a rough idea as to what's going on. All of those issues I mentioned tend to go over their heads, and you can't even blame them. For this reason, many governments, many states have advisory bodies on this sort of questions in place, either ad hoc or more structurally. But then the experts themselves are divided. I see some of the experts nodding in their formation. So there you go. And if that's the case, then what is left? Maybe what is left is legitimacy, because that's always our uh, avenue of last resort, right? If we don't know what to do or what to say anymore, we go to legitimacy. As Carl Schmidt could have said but never did, whoever wants to cheat invokes legitimacy. He said it about humanity, but same, same difference, I'm guessing. It is often invoked when we have nothing left to say. Now, in international law and with international organizations, it used to be the case that actually we did have a legitimacy requirement or uh, criterion, perhaps, which was that it would depend on the competences of a particular organization, and those competences would be based on state consent, and state consent would be based on democratic authority. Ergo, if an international organization would decide to do something within its powers, we would think, international lawyers, international organizations, lawyers, that it would be perfectly fine, perfectly legit. That's no longer the case. International organizations have screwed that up themselves by going too far in that direction, too far in that direction, and the legal mechanism in place never really works because if states agree that a nasty policy is nonetheless within the powers of the organization, then you and I can you know, jump high or low, but then that becomes the position. Legitimacy can also depend on expertise, but that kind of closes the circle again, where expertise is controversial, you still need legitimacy to arise. And you need trust in order for legitimacy to arise. And if we cannot trust the experts, then their governance will not be very legit either. And then there seems to be common concord that legitimacy can also depend on outcomes, output legitimacy, as people sometimes call it. But that may take very long. Causality may be difficult to establish, because how to determine that a policy decided in the 1990s helps prevent something that otherwise would happen now? You can't even imagine such a thing. Is there then no alternative, at least under the global governance, legitimacy and democracy heading? The cynic, the pessimist in me says no. The optimist says it would already be a good idea if instead of doing what the Heritage Foundation does and just say this treaty is bad for the national interest, maybe realize that there is no alternative but all of us to have a little look every now and then at what Hannah Arendt used to call taking care, taking responsibility for our common world. I thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, then our third speaker is David Schlossberg, who is the 2024 ERCO Visiting Professor at the uh, <coughs> Helsinki Collegium, Collegium for Advanced Studies. And he's also the director of the Sydney Environment Institute, as well as a professor 
uh, of environmental politics at the University of Sydney. And his main interests are environmental politics, environmental movements, and political theory. Uh, David. Well. Thanks. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about another specific example, and it's a little different because it's less about technocrats than it is about uh, technology and especially the privatization uh, of technology without that kind of oversight. So I'm interested in and quite critical of um, a growing focus on the use of speculative uh, technologies, and in particular geoengineering technologies, to address, to stave off, to try uh, an attempt to stave off the impacts of climate change. But my own critiques are based on issues of legitimacy, democracy, uh, and justice, in particular um, climate injustice. So I want to talk just about one of those kinds of technological fixes, suggestions for solar radiation management, in particular something uh, that's called stratospheric aerosol injection, uh, or SAI. So the basic idea here is that it's possible to mimic something like a volcano. We can just spray particles out into the stratosphere to block sunlight, to um, reflect sunlight back uh, into space. So this is proposed as a technology that could influence climate change at a planetary scale. Of course, it would require flying hundreds of airplanes uh, constantly, nonstop, um, for years and years continuously around the planet at um, super high altitudes. We don't have the technology, we certainly don't have the money, um, but many of the supporters don't really care about that. Many of the supporters of this technology, developing technology, are of course fossil fuel companies who see it as a way to continue business as usual, spewing greenhouse gases. Um, but this idea of planetary level uh, or planetary scale, stratospheric level, aerosol injection is really the main area of geoengineering advocacy uh, at the moment. So I should differentiate a little bit between these kinds of geoengineering experiments and other kinds of more localized solar radiation management, like cloud brightening, marine cloud brightening, that's much more local, um, that, it, that attempts the same kind of reflection, but a much more um, smaller local scale. Um, there's lots of talk about carbon removal as a kind of geoengineering. I'm happy to talk about that um, in q and I'm less, I shouldn't say less interested, it's less of an issue for me in this context because those kinds of technologies can be managed through existing forms of governance and oversight structures, whereas the kind of SCI um, that we're talking about uh, cannot. So I'll talk a little bit about a proposed non-use agreement for solar geoengineering and the rationale of the folks that have proposed it, um, which really does fit this topic of legitimacy and democracy and global governance. But again, one of the key differences here, I think, in the talks, and we should get at this, um, is the difference between uh, sort of governmental technocracy um, versus technology in the private sector that is outside uh, of governance. So um, I'm one of the initiators, and I don't know how to get it on the screen, so I'll just talk about it, um, and a member of a coordinating group of Global Call for an international non-use agreement on solar geoengineering. It's now been signed by over 500 academics across the globe from 61 countries, and it's been endorsed by over 2,000 NGOs. So the call lays out our opposition to this kind of research, and it says, quote, solar engineering is a false solution to the climate crisis. It would bring huge risks to planetary systems. Its deployment could not be governed in a fair and effective manner. It doesn't address the root causes of the climate breakdown. It would only further delay and derail climate mitigation policies. So we only ask for five things in this non-use agreement. No public funding. So privateers go ahead, no public funding of solar geoengineering re research, no outdoor experiments, no patents, no deployment, and no support in international institutions or agreements. So let me get to the rationale for, these, uh, for our objections, which again really fit the parameters of the discussion that we're having. So I'll talk a little bit about the potential impacts of SRM, violations of principles of justice and democracy, and then the lack of governance structures and oversight. I think it's important to start with potential impacts because we have both known impacts and then, thanks to another infamous American unknown impacts um, of uh, these kinds of wild experiments. 
Um, lots of impacts on the global atmospheric system. Um, there's potential tipping points. Geoengineering could lead to heat and drought in some places, heavy rains in others, food insecurity, forced migration, uh, and a lot more. SRM, if implemented, could increase climate impacts, climate turbulence, and exacerbate a range of climate injustices, including the potential displacement of large uh, populations. So one of the ways that a number of the proponents of solar radiation manipulation, I think manipulation is a better word than management. There's not a hell of a lot of management going on. It's a bit too generous. But the, the, the way some of the proponents justify their argument um, is actually with a moral principle of do no harm. They see climate change as creating harm, and they see this intervention as preventing the harm uh, of climate change. But there's absolutely no data um, to back up this do no harm or a precautionary measure. They also use the precautionary principle, which is actually um, really sort of self-contradictory because they want to introduce uh, a technology that um, is not proven. So we know, again, there's a lot of known impacts. We also know there are a lot of known unknowns about potential impacts. Um, so the argument is that it's potentially very harmful um, and opposition is not unreasonable. So that's just based on impacts and knowledge about what the impacts might be. Oh, thanks. There it is. Um, <laughs> So one of the critiques, and this gets back to Nicole's talk, is based on this democratic idea, um, the all-affected principle or the all-interested principle, a little bit different um, formulations. But it is this basic idea that those who are impacted by a policy should have a say over it. But rather than that kind of democratic in, uh, inclusion, there have been a number of experiments that have been proposed or attempted without any kind of authentic engagement uh, of those that would be impacted. So nearby here in northern Sweden, a couple of years ago, um, a very well-funded funded Harvard-based uh, research group planned a field experiment with absolutely no local engagement. Uh, it was actively resisted by the local Sami uh, people and communities um, who, again, were not consulted. A number of environmental organizations and academics got involved, and the experiment was first delayed and then eventually canceled. Um, another example is uh, a US private company called, uh, and I love these guys, Make Sunsets uh, is the name of the company. They proposed to launch balloons from within Mexico. Why not the US? Big question. But they were going to release balloons from within Mexico that would pop sulfur into the stratosphere. And the plan, of course, was they, were, they had a business plan. They were monetizing this. They were selling carbon credits. Uh, the Mexican government got a hold of the idea. It, was, it went to NGOs. NGOs went to the government. Um, uh, and even though these particular tech bros didn't seek permission from the Mexican government, the government swiftly announced a complete ban on all solar geoengineering um, within the borders of Mexico. Um, I don't know where Make Sunsets is going to go next. But more broadly, across Africa, um, a number of funders and universities are trying to entice African governments to allow this kind of geoengineering research. And a colleague of ours and one of the, um, the co-founders of this organization, Chuck Sokoreki, who's the director of the Center for Climate Change and Development in Nigeria, he published an op-ed in the New York Times last year <laughs> entitled simply, My Continent is Not Your Giant Climate Laboratory. So he argued that efforts, that these kinds of efforts, these kinds of proposals for experiments are just a new way to make Africa a test case for an unproven technology, echoing the worst aspects of colonialism. And since then, actually, the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment has agreed and has called for a non-use agreement globally. So the point here is that there have been a number of attempts to institute this SIA, or um, solar radiation management, um, without seeking any kind of authentic decision-making uh, to govern the experiments. Again, it's not just about technocrats in government, but outside tech experts acting outside of the whole sphere of governance. And that brings me to the third reason that these kinds of proposals are unjust, and that's just because there is no global governance mechanism at all to oversee such radical interventions in the planetary atmospheric system. Um, as my colleague said in a recent piece that's on the website, um, Dispelling the Myths of Geoengineering, 
the world lacks a system of global governance that could equitably and democratically regulate and manage deployment of solar geoengineering at planetary scale. And it's that at planetary scale that's important because again, there are forms of governance at the local level that we can talk about for smaller scale experiments. Um, when it comes to climate governance, um, this piece argues history shows that nationalistic interests, and we can talk about uh, our favorite Americans, often prevent international governance, um, and it would likely be the powerful and the privileged nations that would control and optimize deployment of solar geoengineering for their own interest uh, at the cost of small and less powerful nations. It's actually been really interesting fictionalized uh, accounts of this, including in uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's work. So we hear a lot of proponents argue that geoengineering is necessary because of the failures of global and national governance structures to address climate change. Um, uh, and in contrast, we just say we can't consider geoengineering until we have such governance uh, in place. And we make a number of recommendations for how to construct it. So there's a recent piece led by um, another member of the group, Ardi Gupta, um, who's at Wagenen, who's recently published an article on the various kinds of governance mechanisms that are already being used for other types, but similar types uh, of, um, of technologies. So they talk about existing bans or restrictions on chemical weapons, on biological weapons, on weather modification techniques, on anti-personnel landmines, on ozone depletion, trade and hazardous waste, deep seabed mining, mining in Antarctica. There's a whole range of governance controls on things that would impact uh, global systems. And they also assess emerging norms in um, a number of new and novel technologies like geoengineering, um, such as cloning and gene editing. But the point here is that there are a range of potential interventions, governance mechanisms that can be applied to geoengineering research. Okay, so last, just wanted to note that those that advocate for and against geoengineering are uh, really gearing up for further conflict. So I noted the opposition of the Mexican government uh, and the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment. Um, the European Parliament actually supported a non-use agreement um, right before the last COP. Uh, and just this past February, there was a really interesting, I don't know if I'd call it interesting, interesting slash disturbing uh, discussion at the UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi, where Switzerland, uh, proposed an initiative supporting the increase in geoengineering research. The African nations, who thankfully had already discussed this and already come up with a non-use agreement, they responded um, by proposing uh, an amendment that would examine the risks of the technology. Simple request, what's the risk? Um, but they were opposed by the fossil fuel powers, including the US and Saudi Arabia. Right, so the amendment didn't get up, and so the entire idea, uh, the Swiss proposal, failed. Really interesting discussion at the level uh, of the UN, where finally this, not, this discussion of non-use has come in. Um, as my colleague Frank Bierman has written, quote, the negotiations seem to have strengthened the resolve of some countries in the global south to take a strong, proactive, and critical stance against the solar geoengineering engineer being pushed being pushed mainly by US-based scientists and lobby campaigns um, that are funded by the fossil fuel industry and a range of tech bros uh, and their think tanks. So all of this and all of this sort of critique is based on the risk of the technology, the inequity of the technology, but also on the clear lack of democratic, uh, legitimate democratic governance. Um, so there's another issue for us to talk about. There's the, the website, feel free to sign um, at solargeoengineering.org. Thanks. Th thank you so much, David. I, I think these papers fit really well together. So Jan, Jan showed the kind of paradoxes of global governance, especially the public side, and then David added this element of uh, uh, private uh, technolo technology, private tech companies, all of that, and then Nicole had um, had some ideas on how to address some of these problems that became so uh, clear, uh, were clearly shown in, in Jan's and, and David's talk. So um, before I open a discussion, I was thinking to give a couple of minutes for each of the um, 
speakers to react to each other's talks if you wish so. Um, would anyone want to react? Yeah, um, I'll start and then pass it down the line if that works. I guess I am, um, I'm really interested in the way that the private sector is influencing international legal um, agreements today and also kind of the foundational way that they're made. So it seems to me that states often negotiate these agreements, but states don't really represent the global population very well. So some of them are small island states, and then we got China, right, or Brazil. And so it's like one vote in some of these forums that don't really represent the people. And at the same time, you know, you might think like, well, okay, we don't have all these democratic uh, decision-making things that, you know, I would love to see in place, and that David might be able to talk about a little bit um, in practice. But, uh, but, but maybe there's ways of kind of in influencing these um, or, ch or changing the structure of some of these decisions so that um, the corporations don't have such a large role in, in, um, in influencing uh, the debates and the decisions. So I've been watching the pandemic treaty, which you talked about, and you see the corporations going through and redlining all the agreements and, and almost everything they suggest is taken up, whereas like civil society voices, they're pretty much sidelined. I mean, very many groups have signed and, and read, read through the agreements and tried to have a way to speak and it hasn't taken up, right? So it seems like there's a, a standard way that these things have been developed in international law, um, and and the private sector has the resources and things to, to kind of put a, their say in it. But I wondered if you had any reflections on that, Jan, <laughs> <laughs> after hearing your talk and, and, and thinking a little bit about also how corporations are kind of just going out there and they're throwing carb, you know, the sulfur up into the atmosphere, and they've been doing it for 10 years, at least, or at least talking about it. Gates is funding this. It's like it's been going on for a while, and yet the international legal mechanisms necessary to kind of regulate it either aren't developed or aren't developed in the right way to address the problems. Um, can, can your international lawyers help? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, and I mean that both literally and, uh, and figuratively, I guess. Um, now, what, what you see is that direct representation of companies of the private sector in international, uh, in international negotiations is few and far between. But instead of uh, you know, allowing Microsoft at the table or allowing Philip Morris at the table, uh, what, what happened with the Tobacco Convention, for instance, is that some national delegations were composed of representatives of the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. uh, a certain uh, government of, uh, of China, for instance, or the, the, the delegation of China reportedly was uh, very well versed in the uh, advantages of smoking. Um, because it was composed of uh, smoking industry people. Uh, generally, the World Health Organization had a big issue in those days with lobbying. I, I have on my desk like a hefty report, uh, which they wrote afterwards on uh, the detrimental effects of, of lobbying by the private sector. Um, another point to make is, is in connection with David's talk, that if there is no rules in place, if there is no non-use agreement, then it's still considered to be a free-for-all, right? Mm -hmm. Unless that would be domestic legislation uh, curtailing things. But as long as it's not prohibited, it must be permitted. And that means that governments, are, or that, uh, yeah, that governments really are powerless um, un unless they figure out ways to handle this. Um, yeah. That that's an initial reflection. I could go on, no doubt, but maybe uh, David wants to add something. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really interested in this question of who's at the table and and where the influence is. Um, I mean, I think one of the things about the geoengineering issue is, um, I mean, the, the the technocrats don't really have the expertise. Uh, right, so states can't respond, and and what what we've seen in the U.S., for example, is the Academy of Science come out in favor of geoengineering research because it's obviously money that will flow to universities uh, and to the scientists that um, that have those interests. So it's it, it's it, <laughs> there are technocrats in different places, uh, you know, creating uh, yeah creating research or or advocating for research um, without that kind of democratic legitimacy, without that kind uh, of state potential um, state response, because the expertise isn't there. 
Maybe I can add another footnote that uh, some international organizations have done their best to incorporate the private sector. Maybe the best example is the International Telecommunications Union, which is the current incarnation of that early telegraph union, which accepts um, sort of like customer loyalty schemes with the, the private sector. So companies can buy into, but also research institutes, but of course it's mostly companies can buy themselves either a gold card or a platinum card. The ITU works with three different pillars. If you have a gold card, you can participate in two of them. If you have platinum, you can participate in all three. So you have, you have no voting rights, but you have so much access. They, they organize world fairs, world telecom fairs every year in swanky places where part of the agenda of the meeting is indeed the informal networking between private and regulators. Uh, so that there's a whole world out there that mm -hmm. usually bypasses our vision. Mm -hmm. uh, the ITU is the most prominent example, perhaps, but still. In the pandemic agreement also, um, for $1,000, you can get into the negotiations. You have to know this, and you have to know which civil society organization is able to kind of has observer status. But it is possible for individuals, um, but it's largely companies and other organizations that have already that kind of financing to, to join. I was not aware of that. Thank you. That's something to look into. <laughs> I hope, yeah. 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 Hmm. Do others have uh, questions you would like to post to? I, I had a very other? factual question for David, having observed on the news last week the, the rainfall in Dubai. Was that, was that, no? No, it wasn't cloud seeding. Okay. It's climate change. That was climate change? Yeah. I thought it had been artificially uh, provoked. No, no, it wasn't. Okay. I mean, they definitely, Emirates does cloud seed, but they hadn't in that instance. Okay. But that, of course, was the rumor that spread. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's comforting or discomforting, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll figure that out in due time, no doubt. Yeah. But, uh, but even if so, cloud seeding, again, is one of these local interventions, right? It only has an impact on that country. So they govern their own cloud seeding. That's up to them. There's not going to be a global impact, maybe global travel, right, clearly. But that's a different kind of instance. And, there, and uh, we're not calling for a limit on that kind of technology um, because there are already governance mechanisms in place. It's the technocrats in Emirates that make that decision. I think now we could open the discussion for the audience as well, both uh, online and, and, and in the room. But maybe while you, you think of uh, your questions, I, I could ask one question from each of the panelists. I think for, for um, both Nicole and Jan, it's a bit similar. So Ni Nicole was thinking of like problems in addressing the, uh, solutions in addressing this um, um, Legitimacy <coughs> problems, democratic problems, and um, Nicole, you, you suggested the people could have a say. You you also written a bit on solidarity, and Jan ended with this uh, kind of a reference to virtues and ethics. And you have previously researched um, research um, virtue ethics and their role in in um, global governance and decision making of international institutions. So. Would each of you like to say a word on how you could see the role of uh, solidarity and virtue ethics in, in addressing some of these, these uh, problems that were presented in the talks? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the commitment to helping everyone live a minimally good life, at least, uh, is really foundational for a lot of agreements in international law. So why are we motivated to create a pandemic treaty? Well, it might be national interest in some cases, but I don't think we're going to get a very good pandemic treaty out of that because pandemics, you know, they're infectious diseases. They affect people around the world. You can't really control them in one place. Um, health is kind of a global public good. And we need to think with solidarity about how to create these agreements. Who should have a say? What should be the rules of engagement? I think it... It should be a commitment of every negotiator around that table to, to work for the global public good, right? To try to help represent um, not just their country's interests, but what's best for everybody. Because I think that is the only way we're going to get what's best 
even you know for us here in the U Finland or, or United States, there's where I come from. So, um, and that commitment to solidarity is an ethical commitment. But it would, uh, if people come to that uh, negotiating table in that way, if countries are willing to put aside those mm, very nationalistic interests when we have something very significant at stake, then I think we'll get better agreements, both sort of in the details of it and, and so forth. Um, as far as like putting it into practice, though, I really want to hear David talk a little bit about um, how you know how do we get people to have more of an equitable say? Because you know states negotiating something is one thing, um, and they can do their best to kind of represent the global interest if they understand it. But but they need a lot more information than they typically have. So if you look at like the global response to the pandemic through through Covax, which was the um, the vaccine arm of the ACT Accelerator basically tried to vaccinate the world. You know, they weren't very representative. Again, you had all these white guys um, from from in big institutions in global health um, who were making decisions and then doing things like, okay, we have these vaccines at the last minute, I'll give them to Malawi. But Malawi didn't have like the capacity to distribute those vaccines. And so they came there, they came there like two weeks before expiry, they're like, burn them. What do we do with these? We can't distribute them. Like, burn them. And then they get vaccine hesitancy. And this is, I think, fairly predictable, if you know anything about Malawi. But, but if you had people throughout that decision-making process who were more representative of the global population, if people had uh, say, I think it would be better. And you see people in developing countries speaking on the pandemic agreement and saying, hey, we want a chance to actually have fact these negotiations. I don't know how they're being sidelined, but I don't think sidelining people is like an effective way to get to a good agreement. Um, yeah, but just to respond, I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of talk about here. I mean, um, this question of, uh, you know, how we can get governments to think beyond themselves, beyond their own interest, and think more uh, in terms of solidarity. I think we're already seeing that when it comes to solar geoengineering. And interestingly, it's in response to white academics in the US attempting experiments, mainly in the global south or on indigenous populations. Right, so you're seeing that sort of reaction to, and that, it's that sort of, uh, that memory of trauma of other forms of experimentation on colonies uh, and in the South, that I think is helping to bring together that kind of solidarity that we saw in February in Nairobi, um, you know, where it's not just, not just Mexico, it's not just a couple of African countries, it really is a number of countries in the global South responding in solidarity to the, th the potential threat um, to their interests. So I think it's happening. I mean, we, when we started this a couple of years ago, that certainly wasn't the case. There was no knowledge, right? There just wasn't that kind of response. But now that's growing. Should I add something to that still? Yeah. Um, I, th I think solidarity is mostly a mindset. You cannot really catch it in rules. You cannot catch it in things like representation. Because as soon as you do that, then everyone who's sitting around the table starts to defend their own interest as well. Uh, so that's like previous big treaty negotiations have suggested as much that uh, representatives from states A, B, and C are just as bad as those from D, A, and F in pushing their own national interests. So that's not a matter of solidarity in the end. You have to get people to think, uh, and, and that's of course a hell of a task. <laughs> that's, uh, like the the, what is it, the oikotia in Finnish, the shortcut, the shortcut thank you, <laughs> would be to, uh, to say, okay, we sort of institutionalize solidarity. The UN even has a special rapporteur on solidarity at the moment who tried to come up with a solidarity treaty. Um, and there's not much there there, really. It's, it's, it's in the, the hearts and minds of people. Actually, from David, I still wanted to ask, so what, what is the... Maybe you said it and I missed it, but where does China stand in this? So, so we had kind of EU and Africa and some global south is against, and then US is standing behind the tech pros, and uh, where, where is China? I don't have a good answer to that other than the speculation that technology is being developed and may be put into use, right? Um, but. There's really been, it really hasn't been a major player in the discussions. Yeah. Maybe because it doesn't 
<laughs> I mean, like the U.S., doesn't really feel as if the governance will cover them. But I don't. I just don't yeah. know. Yeah. So now we could um, gather some questions from the audience or, or from, from online. Hi, uh, Lasse Pelton, I'm from University of Eastern Finland. Very thanks for the for the interventions and the discussion. Uh, my question: I'm kind of thinking. Uh, I'm working in environmental policy, so David's talk uh, resonated probably most, but uh, but also for the others, the uh, in the climate change um, debate. Of course, climate changes uh, has become, and it's also increasingly being um, uh, kind of announced as a, as a global crisis. We have a, it's a climate emergency. So we have this kind of state of emergency type of discourse, which I think does lend legitimacy to all kinds of techno technological, technocratic efforts to kind of solve that and fix it really quickly because it's a, it's a state of emergency. So I'm kind of wondering about this state of emergency as a... Um, as a contextual kind of landscape, uh, which was, of course, also part of the pandemic. Uh, we had a state of emergency, so we need rapid action, no time for representation, no time to discuss stuff. Uh, and so, so that's, that, that I'm interested in this, this kind of the context of, um, and also, I, I guess, legitimacy is mostly typically discussed as a kind of form of, like, in, in the context of the state, for instance. But I think there's this kind of kind of legitimacy that arises from the kind of call of the moment, uh, so to speak. So just on that, I mean, I, I found it very interesting that, okay, so the climate emergency idea came through the um, Extinction Rebellion protests. Extinction Rebellion's number one demand was tell the truth. Right? And the truth was, we're in the midst of a climate emergency. But one of the other key demands of Extinction Rebellion, and something that's spreading pretty wide, is more citizen climate assemblies. So the response isn't the kind of authority that you would see, you know, in this sort of emergency authority, more police on the streets. The response is, governance hasn't been working. We need more direct democratic governance. We need to get some answers from the people in order um, to move forward. So. It's been really interesting to see the emergency idea coupled immediately with more democracy, more deliberative democracy, more direct democracy. I'd add a little of, yeah. Um, it, you know, one of the things you see in the climate change space is that this talk about emergency is often a way to sideline something. So like the talk about equity and ethics, it's like too slow, we have to address this now. And I think, that is, you know, that's a, that may be so, but that's a really substantive decision, right? If you don't take into account the distributive effects of these policies when you implement them, lots of people are gonna suffer without any kind of compensation, for instance. Um, and so I think that that public feedback really, again, is pretty important in making these kinds of decisions. Um, and to add one thing, you know, it isn't, it is true that in emergencies you get a certain kind of license sometimes that to do things that you wouldn't in other cases. So if, you know, a central bank, you know, minister can like prevent a major recession, but doesn't have time to ask anybody, needs to change the interest rates, like by all means change the interest rates. But those then distributive effects of this kind of decision, I think, do merit public discussion and deliberation and compensation. And then whether they're going to be okay, it's okay for the, the minister's decision to just be made. I think it depends a little bit on the institutional context, like whether there's a just state that can compensate for the distributive effects or not, right? So if you're in a poor country context where there's not a good, you know, not a good uh, administrative state or something that can compensate for these effects, then it's, it's more questionable than if you have a, a state that can, can take care of it. So... I actually wrote a piece a couple of years back called The Love of Crisis, where I suggest something like a political economy of the crisis. The crisis is socially constructed, and it is socially constructed by those who have an interest in perpetuating certain governmental, regulatory, or other uh, stakes. 
Um, so I think you're actually spot on, yes, that legitimacy derives often from the sense of crisis, but that sense of crisis may very often be manufactured by those who have an interest in that, so one should even look behind that uh, for what it's worth. I'm not at all sure, for instance, that we've ever had a migration crisis, and I prefer not to use that term, like issue or something more neutral than that. The question I have, thanks for this, um, the question I have for the panel is whether increasing legitimacy in democracy and global governance is the end goal, even if it makes things worse. <laughs> Because I see these things in tension where, um, you know, increasing representation, you know, balancing lived experience with scholarly expertise, recognizing that technocracy is autocracy, all of those things toward the, toward the goal of increasing legitimacy and democracy may be hard enough just to have that as the end. Um, and I think we have lots of democracy experiments for our species over the last few centuries, for instance, that show that sometimes the outcomes, things get worse. So I'd like you to discuss this, because this is what technocrats talk about. <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more from the panel about whether, if you were to articulate a goal for increasing legitimacy and democracy and global governance, whether that should, should or should not be conditioned on whether it makes things better or worse. Yeah, so I explicitly say that it has to promote the interests <coughs> of the people at stake. And in particular, I'm concerned about people's ability to live good lives or good enough lives overall. And there can be other things you care about as well that maybe ought to be in that kind of end goal that we're all going for. But if you think that, you know, everybody on the planet should be able to live well enough, like minimally good lives at least, then you want to give people a say when it promotes that end, right? And if it actually sets that back, then no, you don't want to give them a say. And, and sometimes, you know, people can be coerced, manipulated, ill-informed, lack expertise, lack understanding. There can be a variety of reasons why people, giving people a say, would actually make things worse, right? And um, I mean, there, there's absolutely expertise, and, and we need to acknowledge that and, and understand that some things are technical questions and some things are not. And a lot of things look like technical questions that have a value dimension. So often there's a room for people to come in and have a say, and that I think is really important because it helps advance their interests in living a good life. Partly it has an intrinsic value that is like it having a say over how your life goes is, is important to most people, but partly it's because um, it can help us make better decisions when people who are affected are able to share that information, feed into the process, um, might bring new perspectives into a debate or discussion. But you need to have like a constitution, basically, in a democracy. You need to have basic values that are protected. And, and I think those human rights, if you want to put it in the global sphere, should protect people's ability to live minimally good lives. And those can't be violated by the deliberative processes that we input. I hope that was clear or helpful. I would come from a different angle. I would wonder whether conceptually you can have something legitimate that is bad for you. Um, and I don't think you can as long as output legitimacy is part of legitimacy. If it's purely based on input, yes, we can go, go democratically to hell, so to speak, uh, based on democratic decision making or based on uh, what one might call legitimate procedure or process. But if the, um, if the outcome, if the substance should have something to do with it, and I think it does usually, that, uh, that one cannot completely separate legitimacy, which I'm not a fan of, as you may have noticed, um, but you cannot completely separate it from the sort of decision being taken, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I yeah. agree with the other responses, but I'd also add, I mean, so another example um, of democracy in the face of the climate crisis. So 
and I talked about this um, a couple of months ago in a talk I gave here, been doing some work with communities that have been um, experiencing all kinds of climate disasters, the fires in Australia, flooding, repeated flooding, um, and all of that. And it's been a really interesting time in terms of the relationship between local communities and the state government, the state government in charge of emergency response, resilience, and adaptation planning. And there has been a resistance on the part of the state to more democracy and more, especially, democratic local knowledge. Um, but <laughs> there's been some really interesting knowledge coming out of local organizations that's making its way up to the state that is helping the state to make better decisions about emergency and resilience planning. So, and I think it's, I mean, if we're going to judge it, it's not just more democracy, it's not just more legitimacy, those are crucial, but it's also about what, you know, for what, what for what end, right? The sort of, <laughs> some sort of preservation of functioning lives. Uh, and I think in terms of the climate emergency, um, in terms of the impacts of it, I think that's important, that kind of inclusion of local knowledge of something as straightforward of risk reduction during a flood. Um, is something that um, that will bring better decision making, save lives, uh, and all of that. But it's a really good question. Mike. What's is, is that? Is democracy the end, or is saving people's lives, at, you know, better quality of life the end? And I agree, it's the latter. Yeah, I think there's a question from online. Is this on? Yes. So I'll convey the questions. There are two questions, and maybe actually the second one connects better to what David just said, so I'll post that first. Um, so this is by listeners at Umeå University, Northern Sweden. Uh, what would happen today if we discovered the hole in the o ozone and the role of CFS CFSs now? So if we discovered <laughs> this now, what would happen? That's a really depressing question. <laughs> Um, because last time it happened, there was actually an agreement fairly quickly, uh, you know, a global agreement fairly quickly, a phase out uh, of CFCs and, uh, yeah, preservation and sort of shrinking of the whole. What would happen now? I, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I, um, I think one of the differences um, with the, um, the ozone agreement as opposed to a number of issues around climate governance is there wasn't a single really powerful industry like the fossil fuel industry. Um, and there was, there was a fairly small industry and it was going to be uh, pretty significantly uh, compensated uh, for the change. So I'm not, I mean, on the one hand, uh, uh, yeah, I don't like the question because I don't have faith that there would be a, a, a global agreement. But on the other hand, um, you know, what has tanked global agreements on climate is the power of the fossil fuel industry, and we just don't have that kind of power in a CFC industry. Good question, though. Should I post the second one? Yep. So this is by Rio Umeda. Um, what is the role of AI in the future of global governance? Um, the CEO of OpenAI said that artificial general intelligence would solve complex societal problems such as climate change. Is that possible? And even if it if it is possible, who could who would be in charge? <laughs> Whoa, that's a small question. Um, Jesus, what what to make of that? Speaking of technocracy. Speaking of technocracy, yes, that's uh, unbridled faith in uh, the power of the human mind to devise something even more powerful than the human mind. We know where the human mind has gotten us, so I wouldn't hold my breath necessarily. Uh, and all the other questions, of course, remain the distributive questions, the, the feasibility questions, perhaps, the, the fairness, the legitimacy. Uh, so, if, yeah. I can talk a little bit. So, like, it is amazing how artificial intelligence is used in health already. So it's used, for instance, in diagnosing diseases. 
And there's, you know, questions about the ability to oversee these kinds of decisions, even in a local doctor's office, right? So if you're using these diagnostic tools and they're provably better than human kind of diagnosis, in some instances, we're going with it, right? It's the way we land our airplanes, actually. Like there's uh, algorithms and we vote, they vote. There's seven of them or something. <laughs> they vote and then the plane lands that way and we're safer than we are with people. So I guess you should feel confident about it. I, th I suppose a artificial intelligence will help us solve a lot of problems. Um, governance problems, it's a little less clear exactly how they're going to be involved. Um, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I think that using those tools successfully is pretty important, and being able to kind of understand what's going on behind the the screen is also really important because they do raise a bunch of ethical questions. Um, the algorithm's not being transparent, they're not being uh, kind of understood in a certain level by the average user or, or maybe any user. Um, and then the implicit biases that come into that often. So when you train up these uh, their neural networks, basically uh, technologies that behind, behind generative AI, uh, you get uh, you get all the human biases because they're using kind of human data. So you'll have discrimination uh, against people who are African American in terms of getting health insurance. And so I think it's definitely not going to be a panacea. It will raise a lot of difficult issues, however it's used, and uh, we need a lot of ethical reflection on that. And governance. I realize it's a privilege to get to ask a second question, but <laughs> thank you for considering it. There's also, there seems to be an implicit um, view on the panel that the more representation and discourse that takes into account um, the, the, the perspectives of people that are most affected, that that will help us move toward, move in the direction of consensus about what to do. My experience on the ground in working with groups in local communities on shifting from extractive community-based research to community-based participatory research where the, the main stakeholders are the members, representatives of the members of the community is that it often increases conflict and um, yeah, it, it, it definitely, it, often does not move us toward consensus about what to do. And so I'd like to, um, that's my own uh, experience. I'm not saying that's the norm, but I'm sharing that experience to put some meat on the bone of my question, which is, do you think that most of the time, if we were able to successfully enact the things you're recommending, it would move us toward consensus about what to do. Um, and I'd like, I'd like for you to try to convince me that that, that would actually be the case. So, Does that make sense? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take it first if it's okay. And I'm gonna say that you know, it's, it's about the design of the processes for any particular question, I think. So I think that you want to design a good process for public input that improves the decision, not necessarily gets consensus, right? People can agree on terrible things. <laughs> so it's not consensus that's the goal, right? You want to protect people's ability to live minimally good lives and help them flourish and uh, prevent flooding and whatever it is that you're doing in that particular case. And, and that requires that you get the right information from the people who are affected, and then you act appropriately on that information. And sometimes, you know, it might be just, you want to have, be open to objections. The policymakers can make it, the decisions, the decisions implemented, but you at least hear there's a mechanism for like, receiving information after the fact. In other cases, it might be that you need a fully democratic process, right? You should really take a vote on the basis of this information. So what kind of process you need to get that public input for any particular decision is gonna depend on what the decision is, how important it is, how it affects people's interests, whose interests are affected, and a variety of other things. So I don't think there's gonna be a, a general answer, but I think when technocrats are making decisions, they need to get clear on when is it a technical question and when it is, a, is it a value question. And at what points do those technical decisions affect people's ability you know, to live good lives? And that's the point where like, 
then you probably need to ask some, somebody else because it's not a purely technical question, right? If it can affect their life this way or that way, if we're going to take into account the impacts of this technology on future generations or just the present generations for climate change, that becomes a value question, right? That's a question we as a society need to decide. And in some way, those future people need to be represented, I think, because we, you know, not everybody's going to be so future-minded, right? There needs to be some, some deliberative... Uh, procedure that would get those perspectives of like the younger generations on the table, actually, I think. I already uh, mentioned earlier that I think solidarity is a mindset and uh, it's not necessarily the case that more representation or wider representation would automatically lead to consensus. I guess experience suggests, as, as your own experience suggests often the other way around, that the more people you have on the table, the more difficult it is, regardless of where they come from and, and whose interests they would represent and what sort of position they would represent. Just the larger the numbers, the more tricky it will get. Um, but that, raises, <laughs> that brings back the point, is, is consensus really what you're going for necessarily? And uh, I, I must say I'm, I'm drawn to, to Nicole's minimal condition that... Uh, uh, as long as one gets affected, one should have a say. And we have too often ignored that. That would, of course, also mean that we get to vote in US elections. Um, but <laughs> if, even more practical, I, I never understood why Brexit was a decision left to the British, because it affects the other 27 member states of the EU just as badly. Um, so why that sort of uh, decision? Maybe we should devise some kind of global gerrymandering to, to get this kind of thing worked <laughs> out. Good article title, yeah, by the way. Like, yeah. That's, uh, it's a re again, a really good question. And I th think, getting back to the geoengineering issue, part of the problem is that there is currently an attempt to manufacture consensus without consultation. So dissensus is a good thing. Right? And it's what happened in Nairobi in February, right? where the Swiss tried to create a consensus around something without the consideration of those broader interests. So I don't see dissensus as a problem. Right? If, if we don't have agreement on something like geoengineering, then we don't go forward. Right? The problem is if we don't have agreement and we do go forward, right, that's problematic. Um, but I don't think we're, we're not necessarily, I mean, we should be seeking, when it comes to new technologies, there should be consensus to go forward. It's a basic precautionary principle, right? But if you don't have that, it's not a terrible thing. You just don't institute the technology. <coughs> and on this particular issue, I'm more than fine with that. But you don't, you, I mean, again, the fear and the concern was that sort of manufacturing. I mean, one of the things that, that motivated us to write this call for a non-use agreement was this increasing normalization of the language of geoengineering and this sort of this attempt to build consensus that of course we need to geoengineer you know when the temperature gets up to this or, or you know and it was just this uh, it was coming from the scientists it was coming from some of the academies the new york times was you know, repeating the thing. And so there was just this sort of building of this normalization of consensus around using the technology without engaging on the interests of those that could be affected. And that's a problem. Yeah. I think we have a, another question online. So here's a question by a researcher from the Alexandri Institute. Um, how could access to higher and particularly international education govern globally when some countries or societies consider higher education as a public good, but the others consider it as a public, um, sorry, no, it's, the others consider it as a privilege? Okay. <laughs> okay can, can you run the question again? So this is about higher education, so mm -hmm. it goes a bit to a different context. But so the question is, how could um, access to higher and particularly international education govern globally when some countries or societies consider higher education as a public good and some others don't? They consider it as a privilege. <laughs> 
So I think it's um, it's a hard question, right? So for me, I have a, my own ethical perspective that comes out of this book, so I'll talk about it a little bit, which is I think that what we should care about is people's ability to live minimally good lives. And so the question really becomes one about like how does higher education affect people's ability to live at least minimally good lives? So you can make an argument that like having these opportunities, these amazing opportunities from my perspective that you have in Finland to retrain, for instance, really affect people's ability to live well enough or that the knowledge coming out of this higher education is really important for you know understanding and addressing problems like climate change. Then I think you could build a case um, that would support it if if people grab on to the ethical perspective that hey we should help everyone live at least minimally good lives. I don't know, not quite see the connection between the question and and the topic of technocracy, <laughs> but maybe it's you know that um, if if we want to have genuine experts, we need to have genuine knowledge, and that comes out of higher education, and, and we want technocracy to function well, and that involves public participation, but it also involves um, uh, really taking seriously the, the knowledge that can help us make good decisions. Are, are there still places where higher education is purely conceived of as a public good? Because I think even here it has become a little bit more marketized, a little bit more commodified. And we teach our students to compete with each other. We, we try to get them out of the university as quickly and as in as big numbers as possible. Um, so maybe it's a false dichotomy <laughs> underlying the question. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure there is much like purely public good anymore in this idea, other than uplifting and social mobility and, and stuff. Maybe that's the... But then again, as, as Nicole says, I'm not sure I see the connection with what we're talking about so much. Well, and even if you, if you do assume that higher education is a public good, I'm thinking about the researchers at Harvard that are pushing for geoengineering, right? And they're making a public good argument. Right? But, but all public good arguments are not the same. Uh, you know, so we're both making public good arguments, just in different ways. So uh, I don't think necessarily agreeing that the university is there for the public good actually solves the problem. I mean, there's these difficult empirical questions too, right? Even about geoengineering. So if if we, you know, are in this climate crisis and and things aren't, we can't get that political governance <laughs> going, right? The the argument for geoengineering is, you know, maybe we could design something that would protect us, and so. You know, there is an argument there, and it really depends on the details of the science and the and the um, effects of these technologies, whether it's a good argument or not. Yeah. I think um, it's not. <laughs> but um, but that's the that's science so part. Important. That's not the yeah. the education part per se. Yeah. Right? yeah, you need the education to be able to evaluate it, and we need people to be educated to make good decisions. So, it might be an argument for seeing education as a public good in order to have good governance, but it's a, it's a loose connection. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, I think 90 minutes is, is up. Uh, so I would really warmly like to thank again the Coalition for Advanced Studies for organizing the events, uh, the audience for coming, and especially our three great speakers. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> thank you. <so> much. <laughs>